So, Prof, where do we stand now? Mm. Um, you know, can this be appealed? Can it be clarified? Um, yeah. What are your thoughts, Prof? Yeah. So, Sean, I mean, I think the first really important point just to make is, is and, and, you know, I've had many, many conversations now over the last 24 hours over this. Um, and I think that the first really important point to make is that this is it, right? This is the final judgment in this matter. Um, and, and it's important to realize that for a number of, on a number of different bases that, that might not be, um, you know, for, for somebody that's not in law might, might not be evident. Um, firstly, it may seem confusing that um, there's a lot of talk in the judgments and in the order about um, leave to appeal and leave being granted. And that might create the impression that this thing is still going forward. No, the custom of the constitutional court is to decide whether to grant leave to appeal and the appeal itself at the same time. It's, right. it's just a, a, a practice they do, right? right? So this judgment is both those things. <clears throat> My apologies. It is, on the one hand, granting the minister leave to appeal and simultaneously deciding that appeal, right? right. Um, so if you, if you perhaps quickly jump back to the order, um, Sean, we can quite clearly see that in, in three and four. That's exactly what's happening there, right? So the court is saying, three, we, we, leave, we grant you leave, Minister of Finance, to appeal this judgment. Four, we decide the appeal and we decide it against you. Now, um, the effect of that is, as you've said, that the Supreme Court of Appeal judgment and importantly, for our purposes, the, the, the only really important thing of the Supreme Court of Appeal is the order, not the reason. The order stands. Um, the court did not, the Constitutional Court did not interfere with that at all. I think that's probably, for me, the most surprising. I mean, I always thought that this outcome would be possible. I didn't think that we will, yes. this will be the outcome, but... I always thought that there's a possibility that the Constitutional Court would agree with the Supreme Court of Appeal, but I certainly never thought that we, we will get just this blunt order from the, from the Constitutional Court. And if you skip ahead to the notice from the, from the National Treasury, I think it's quite clear there that they also didn't contemplate that this will ever happen. And I'm as surprised as, as they must be that we got nothing more from, from the Concord. And unfortunately, this is, this is exactly now um, placed us in this almost impossible position. So, so firstly, the court has now finally dealt with the, um, the appeal. Also remember the constitutional court is our highest court. There's nowhere to go after this, right? This is the right. end of the road. The only um, response now can be a legislative one, right? And it could be legislative either uh, in terms of primary legislation, right? So parliament can simply change the legislation uh, or more viably for the short term, at least, it can be secondary legislation like the regulations at issue in this very case. Now, of course, there are many difficulties with that. Um, firstly, Primary legislation, getting anything through Parliament, is by no way a quick process, right? So I don't think we can put any store in that's going to solve our problems. Long term, absolutely, and we know that process is ongoing in any case. But short term, that's not a solution. The problem with uh, new regulations is that on one reading of the majority judgment of the Constitutional Court. It suggests that the minister cannot make regulations in this regard at all. Yeah. Which of course means that, well, there's nothing for the minister to do or say. Now, we can have, I think, a long debate, and Sean, you and I have had this debate, and I've, I've continued the debate with many people over the last 24 hours, whether that's actually correct, I, I'm still not buying. I'm not sure I agree with the, with the majority. Um, if I were kind of a, a gambling man, I would, I would definitely advise the minister to take another bite at the cherry. I wouldn't just take this lying down. <clears throat> but um, 
but but I think the one thing that we can certainly say to each other is that there is significant risk here. Uh, should National Treasury, the minister, decide to simply issue replacement regulations? I, yeah. I think there is a yeah. real risk. Yeah. And I think yeah. that's also why an argument like, um, are we just reverting back to the 2011 regs, cannot, cannot fly. Technically, it cannot fly. Mm. It doesn't work like that. A previous set of regulations do not automatically revive. But also, uh, on a more substantive reasoning, the very same problem that's now resulted in the 2017 regs being declared invalid will also hit the 2011 okay. regs, really. It, it yeah. will be exactly... So th that's not no solution. I tend to think... Um, if I had the minister's ear, and I see we do have some people in the room that might have the minister's ear, um, I would suggest that perhaps the 20, uh, 2001 regs might just make that cut. I'm, I, I think that that particular set might not be too far um, away from what I consider the minister to, to indeed have the power to do, and, and there might be room to maneuver there. Um, but, but, but I, I think, you know, in all honesty, we must say to each other that any form of regulation that's going, that's going to come nationally and that's going to try and in any way frame a preferential procurement policy for an entity is going to be suspect um, as long as Section 2.1 uh, of the Act reads in the way that it does. I, I think that's just the long and the short of it. And we can yeah. scream and jump and disagree with that. I wholly disagree with it. I, I think I think the majority is actually wrong. Um, mm. But but there you have it, right? A narrow majority seems to think that that is the reading of the act. But Prof, I mean, even if we don't agree with it, we have to go with it. We have to absolutely. Yeah, yes, that's so, that's, so, that's the the highest court has decided. Yes, that's the hand we've now been dealt with. So yeah. that's the one that we can, you know. Outside of, of me and Alison and a couple of people, you know, mm. mining this now for a long time for academic content, um, from a practical point of view, it, it's, as you say, it's the hand we've now been dealt with. And, and now I think the attention focus shifts to exactly the kind of questions you're asking. So, so what are the immediate um, sure. consequences? Sure. And then medium and longer term, where do we go with right? With this. So if we then turn to those questions you've got, um, the effective date was yesterday, yesterday morning, 10 o'clock. 10 a.m. Um, and I think that's also important given the suspension of last year uh, or the year before, actually. Yep. Um, that has just disappeared, right? It's, it's events have overtaken us. Um, it would have still had an impact had the Concord delivered its judgment before the 2nd of November last year. Uh, because as I've said, uh, based on the majority judgment, the SEA judgment stands. So that, yeah. that suspension would have been effective. But we are not, right? We're, we're quite a bit beyond it. Right, right. So under the Superior Courts Act, the rule is that um, an appeal judgment is, is stayed until such time as that the appeal is dealt with. Uh, and the effective date is then the date of the appeal judgment. So if we apply that in this case, it means that the preferential procurement regulation 2017 and everything under it, and that's mm. quite important to mm. note, mm. everything under it mm. came to an abrupt end yesterday at 10 a.m. It does not exist anymore. Um, so the question is no. Uh, the answer, sorry, to, to that third is, question is no. Yeah. no. no. We, th it doesn't exist anymore. It is no longer. And of course, we need to then remember that it's not only the regulations that, that fall over. Those regulations, in turn, um, form the mandate for a whole host of other things, most notably the whole designation scheme. Yes. Because designation didn't exist. Uh, outside of these regulations. They owe their, their entire existence to the regulations, first the 2011 and, and, and subsequently the 2017. And it's also even important to note there that the designations done under the 2011 regs only survived 
uh, under the 2017 regs because the 2017 regs explicitly said so, right? right? There was right. no automatic kind of rollover. It's only because the 2017 regs said um, those previous designations are now deemed to have been done under the 2017 regs. Prof, the designations you're talking about is the designated sectors and products, the local yes. content, local production, local content. clothing, yes. textiles, footwear, cement, yeah. the whole yeah. bunch. Sorry, I, sh I, I, should have been, right. I should have clarified that. Right. So uh, that's another important thing to note, um, that yes, the case originally started out fairly narrowly, focusing primarily on pre-qualifications and subcontracting. Right. Those were the big kind of bones of contention, but the matter then completely mushroomed when it got to the SCA. And as we all know, um, especially in the order of the SCA, again, something that I think most of us disagreed with, that, that the SCA was simply wrong in yeah. stating that those regulations cannot exist without pre-qualifications and, and subcontracting, which, which just, you know, objectively, just on the facts is nonsense because they did exist without those two mechanisms in the 2011 version. So it, it remains a mystery to me to this day why they couldn't have severed those two things from the, from the regulations. But again, that's now all become completely that's academic. It. Yeah, yeah. Be because the Concord just said, well, you know, whether we're talking about pre-qualification or mandatory subcontracting or even the matrix for the preference points, all of it is beyond the minister's power. The triple and B one all scores of 20. Yeah, yeah. It's gone. Yeah. All of it is gone. Yeah. Uh, and with it um, also went the local content designations. So that as we sit here today, now, Sean, mm -hmm. there are no legal obligations to comply on with to do any of that. And I think it's 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 a difficult spot. Yeah. Because it's not just that there's no obligation. The more difficult question is whether there's authorization. 